I think it's what's important to understand is this is the fifth year, continuous year of rioting. Yeah. Every other year from 2009 up to last year, the rioting was on the Catholic side. What happened this year was that the Parades Commission said, last year they said to the Orange, look, there's always trouble in the evenings. We want you to come back early. You come back at four o'clock uh, and hopefully we'll avoid any violence. Well, they did come back at four o'clock. They walked past the Ardoin. And again, there was intense violence this year. That, that again, to try and prevent that violence, they said, well, you, can't, you can walk down in the morning, but you can't come back in the evening yeah. time. And then all the trouble flared on the other side. So this time it was solidly orange violence as opposed to green violence in, in almost every other year up to now. And it, it's, it's the thwarting of community will that's really at the base here. And it doesn't seem to be amenable to mediation. It seems to me it's a kind of an all-out, it's an all-out winner-take-all. Is it kind of like Drum Cree was in Portadown? Yes, only it's much less popular. The yeah. rioting that's been happening over the last few days has been uh, a bit like the flag protests. It has involved... It's been spectacular, but it's involved no more than a, uh, a couple of hundred people. Mm. The Glen Cree, or the sorry, not the Glen, the the Drum Cree thing was a much more popular, um, a much more popular protest. The 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 Drum Cree Church um, is very important in Orange history and Orange mythology, whereas in a sense this is a, a, this is a kind of a dying rearguard, if you like, in a in a in a part of Belfast where the Protestant population is dropping. Where yeah, there but are it might be a dying rearguard, but the, but the the people involved are young, aren't they? Yeah, they, yes, they are. Uh, but and I think uh, leaders of loyalism and unionism have rightly come in for some criticism for not providing, um, you know, political leadership for all of that stuff. Um, uh, Nigel Dodds was knocked unconscious. Um, he was at the front trying to kind of remonstrate with the police somehow, and you know, I, so that, that he got hit again, by his own fire. My, yeah, you know, my original thing is that, that Stormont politics appears to be able to do nothing about all of this. A listener, and you, you, you'll have to forgive people in Tipperary for for not maybe understanding the finer points. What's the difference between a loyalist and a unionist? <laughs> Well, in theory, nothing. I mean, they're both loyal to the Crown. Um, and I would say 40 years ago, those those words were used interchangeably. What happened, however, was a change in definitions through the Troubles. And loyalism became a word that was associated with the working class, with the disaffected, and particularly with the paramilitary organisations like the UDA and the UVF. So uh, in, in more modern parlance, Unionism describes the political establishment uh, on the Protestant side, and loyalism is almost could be characterised as a kind of a, the, the leaderless, disenfranchised. Model. So, where would uh, DUP supporters be on that on that line uh, between unionism and loyalism? Uh, well, I would say if you scratch most of them, uh, you'll find that they still adhere adhere to the old definition that they are both unionist. And loyalist, but the truth is, um, they are in political power in Stormont. Um, Peter Robinson is is unionist. He is the, he is effectively in the big house on Stormont Hill. If any yeah. of your listeners have ever been to Belfast, it's the most imposing. It's a very impressive uh, building. Yeah, a huge avenue going impressive. up to it. Yeah, uh, and 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 so they have they have a, as much democratic power as it is possible to get. And yet, the truth is, the reason why the DUP are most prominent here uh, amongst the Orange is that, that the, the disaffected of North Belfast are part of its political base. So although they have power, I, I like Sinn Féin in a sense, they have power up in Stormont, their base is in the, amongst the poorest and the most disaffected uh, of the Protestant communities. So is it a poverty issue? Really? Uh, I think there's two things here. I think poverty pays into it, definitely. A sense of powerlessness. and some, But that is also exaggerated by the sectarian tensions from the war. Mm. These are communities that live side by side. And, and they're communities in which 
the, the murder toll was very, very high, particularly North Belfast. So in Ardoyne, you had a number of uh, Republican paramilitaries doing operations against the British Army, occasionally getting involved in tit-for-tat murder campaigns with their uh, loyalist counterparts. And in Glen Kern, very often there's, a, there's an area there in which many Catholics who were disappeared, uh, their bodies would turn up. Uh, you know, days afterwards, often horribly tortured, etc. So there is a profound distrust that arises from the damage both of these communities in, uh, inflicted upon each other from the troubles. So on top of the poverty and the disaffection, you've got this ba- you've got this basic problem of um, the the real damage that was done, the very high death tolls taken from kind of you know if you if you if you isolate some of these estates. And some of these areas. These are all interface communities, aren't they? They're, they're all communities that have, have barriers uh, up against their neighbours. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how how high are those barriers? But uh, some of these barriers are quite high. There's no real, ba- you know, some of the barriers in this case, the barriers are actually often just the main arterial road. Yeah. Um, which is why the road itself, the Crumlin Road that goes past Ardoin, is is a point of tension. So, the, uh, uh, um, but also, what's happening is that the demographic geography of North Belfast is shifting slowly but consistently from a Protestant majority to Catholic majority. So they're seeing power, political power, ballot box power slipping out of their hands as well. Well, uh, but it's two things. One one side sees power slipping out of their hands, and the other side sees power coming into their hands mm. and some of the tensions it, it, some of the tensions around this is is really ballot, bo- ballot bo- box politics in, in which creating trouble and making orange culture if you like particularly contentious because by and large most orange parades pass off and they're in, the in receipt of a, they're in receipt of, of a lot of government funding now the, the the orange parades aren't they in a kind of an embarrassing cleft stick now because they've called for a suspension of the protest not uh, not a a, a cessation of the protest it's a fine line, line i mean do you think this protest is going to continue I, I think they probably will. The, 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 I, I certainly, at the moment, um, the call from the Orange leadership has uh, to, to cease the protests has fallen on deaf ears. Mm. I think there's been a profound miscalculation uh, uh, amongst the Orange. There's some very great frustration on their part because, as they see it, uh, four years of Republican rioting, very vicious, often going on for four or five days after the actual 12th itself, has been rewarded by... All of all of you know the, by the, the the parades commission. But and what, what about drum but cream? The penalty they're going to yeah. pay is that the rioting on the other side simply slams the door tighter shut for them yeah. on the other. So side. they feel more aggrieved, even even as as a result. They're of feeling this, yeah. doubly aggrieved. Mm. I mean, in a what sense, about drum creed though, um, Mick? And what about what about the flag protest? Is the flag protest still going on? Uh, no, the, the, we haven't heard much from the flag protesters for, for, for several months. And like, there, has Drum Creed been sorted out once and for all? Uh, I think the residents of the Garvahi Road certainly believe that that's uh, over. I think um, the last parade that went down of our Garvahi Road now is, is more than, well, more than 10, 10, 12 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and there is very little, that has become a kind of, a, in, a, in a way, a settled... Uh, a settled outcome. And I, I think the betting is too here in North Belfast that one of the downsides of the orange uh, being seen in public to uh, go down go down the, the violent protest route, that may well put the cap on, on, on their walks in North Belfast as well. Mm. So it's, it's... Uh, in, in some, some senses, it's been a strategic victory for uh, both mainstream Republicans associated with Sinn Féin and dissident Republicans associated with uh, the sort of ongoing uh, violent campaign against the Northern State. Yeah. We um, would have thought that this code victory. trading on both sides should should have been over by now. After after all, the, the Good Friday Agreement is in place for a long time. It is. And I think serious questions need to be asked about how, how effective the partnership between Sinn Féin and the DUP is. Because the truth is, 
This is really the, the only demonstration of politics, public demonstration of politics that we're getting these days. But still, um, didn't they sort it out pretty well in Derry, no? I mean, I don't hear much, much, uh, much problems about parades in Derry. No, uh, they did sort it out, and I think there's a num- there's a number of differences. One, demographically, uh, Derry is a is a is a by far a majority Catholic city. Mm. It's also a majority SDLP city, so it wasn't simply a case. One of the problems that the Orange have residually come up up against is in Belfast, Sinn Fein is by far the largest represent- representative body of Northern Catholic uh, political opinion. That creates difficulty for them because of association with the IRA and its violent campaign. And as I said before, some of, some of, some of the murders that went on have very, had very high-level local impact. Yeah. But in Derry, there were businessmen who uh, were brought in by constitutional nationalists and the SDLP and in, in a sense, the repro- but but also the, uh, there's a higher degree of confidence, I think, amongst the Catholic population in Derry that um, that simply doesn't exist amongst Belfast Catholics. So this is a uh, thing that's going to fester for another few years yet, you think, before it finally dies out? I, I can't see how it doesn't fester um, unless people are prepared to just, um, you know, kind of go to the heart of what the problem is. My My suspicion, however is the long-term project is about the greening of Belfast, that uh, too many obvious political compromises with the orange enemy uh, is, is counterproductive to, to the kind of that, that sort of procession towards, to, towards that final outcome. Mm. Uh, and it makes it very difficult for, the, for those who would, who would you'd be looking for some kind of moderate solution. Yeah. But the funny thing about northern politics is this, in the South and in the UK and right across Europe, most of the Western world, the middle classes are the people who get listened to yeah. as far as social policy is concerned, economic policy, educational policy, etc. The, the reverse is the case in post-conflict Northern Ireland. Is the, the, it's the concerns of the people who elected the major political parties. And in the DUP and in Sinn Féin, their base is in working class Belfast and across the north. And so so these are the politically most important communities for those two. Those two uh, so they have to try and bring them with them and they have to appease them as well at times. Yes, and if you want to create discomfort for your political enemy, you just create a bit of discomfort in those working class areas, up the tension a little bit, and, and it all gets very difficult. As Mark Langhammer, who's an independent Labour councillor or was in Newton Abbey once famously put it the, the what happened to the middle class in Northern Ireland is in 1969 they went off to play golf and they never came back <laughs> yeah yeah I can see I can see where he's coming from all right but um, it's it's a problem uh, it's a it's a an intractable problem, and it continues. It's not doing uh, the North any any favours when it comes to try and sell their wares abroad or, or attract industry or anything like that. It's actually probably undone all the good that was done through the the the, the G the G eight summit. Uh, and and you really have to ask uh, the amount of money that the Office of First and Deputy First Minister have been spending on trade missions to Brazil, to China, to the United States. Uh, what use is that when the PR is saying to capital, which is notoriously nervous of violence, yes. come to us? And I mean, everything? why would you? Why would you? Well, indeed, and you have to say, it, the, the, some of this stuff is really about the incapacity of those two parties in OFM, DFM, to organise, um, well... You know, you know where that that saying goes. That old saying about breweries and yes, and uh, couldn't organise. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, I do not know that. Said, look, you've explained it to us very well, Mick, and thanks for doing so.